Um, all right, so we're going to continue on in our uh, series called Simple. And if you're just visiting, I know I've, I've seen some new faces here this morning. This sermon series, we've been having a lot of fun because what we're doing is we're kind of breaking it down, stripping it down. Um, I love to dig deep into Scripture. I love to, you know, pull stuff out. We are actually going to look at a Greek word today, okay? So just bear with us here. Uh, but I love to really dig in and see what the text means. But I think it's valuable at times for us to really, really keep the cookies on the bottom shelf, to really make things simple so that we can just look at a passage and it's, it's one story and what I've been doing so far at least is picking one very well-known story from Scripture, reading through it, looking at it, and just finding some very simple points about how we as followers of Jesus ought to act and ought to live. And so we're calling ourselves simple followers of Jesus, but with simple, I don't mean like uh, not complicated. I mean really more like just pure, just like true followers of Jesus. So we're looking into God's word and seeing what he has for us. So today it is simple, the road to Damascus, the road to Damascus. Of course, this is the story of the conversion of this guy, Saul of Tarsus, into this guy, Paul the Apostle. So uh, really cool story. Most of you guys have heard of this. Um, how many of you have been to Israel? Raise your hand. Okay, very cool. It's a lot of people in here. Uh, many uh, went with me. We took a trip a few years ago. Uh, we got to go to this place called Mount Bental. And Mount Bental doesn't have a whole lot of uh, spiritual or scriptural significance, but it's a really cool place to go. It's all the way in the north of Israel, and it's right on the Israel-Syria border. And at the top of Mount Bental, there's like this military installation where it's a lookout. Um, and I've talked about this before, where they had NATO peacekeepers up there keeping an eye, because, you, I mean, you're right on the edge of the mountain, and, and right down, and boom, that's Syria right there, and you can see a Syrian town, and it's, it's a very much a rebel town right out there. So uh, these peacekeepers, they keep an eye on what's happening in Syria, depending on kind of the temperature and the lay of the land. Um, and so when the day that we were there um, at Mount Bental, it was a little bit cloudy, but every once in a while, the clouds would kind of disperse and you could see out into Syria. Well, if you've been there, if you can remember, if you're looking out to the north towards Syria, about your 11 o'clock or so, there was a road that came around from this way and it went up towards Damascus. And, and people say on a really, really clear day, you can actually see the city of Damascus from that place in, in northern Israel. That, many people believe, is the road to Damascus where Paul um, had this experience where we're going to read about today. So, um, so to catch you up to speed with what's going on, pretty interesting. If you've got your Bibles, you can turn to Acts chapter 7. We're going to read a couple verses in Acts 7, a few verses in Acts 8, and then we're going to camp out in Acts chapter 9. But I want to kind of bring us up to speed as you're turning there uh, to Acts chapter 7. So there was this guy, he was a disciple of Jesus. Now he wasn't one of the 12 apostle disciples. He was a follower, a disciple of Jesus, and his name was Stephen. And most of you guys have heard of Stephen. He was uh, this disciple who was wrongfully accused of blasphemy against Moses and of God. Well, see, you don't do that. And they didn't like him. They didn't like that he was preaching uh, this Jesus of Nazareth or preaching the way, as we'll see here in a little bit. So uh, the Pharisees, they're like, we've got to get this guy. We've got to take him out because we don't want him preaching this guy, Jesus. Like there's already so many people that are thinking this Jesus guy is real. No, we crucified him and they stole his body. Okay, that, you know, that whole resurrection thing, that didn't really happen. So we've got to squash this thing called these followers of Jesus or followers of the way. And so in Acts chapter 57, or excuse me, Acts chapter 7, verse 57, uh, it says this, and at this, that's the, the, the Jewish uh, Sanhedrin, the religious court, at this they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. 
So they, they let him make this appeal, and he goes through this humongous historical account of, of just the beginning, all, you know, Moses, Abraham, this, and he was spot on with everything. And they're like, yep, okay, you're tracking, you're tracking, you're tracking. And then he had to say it. He had to say, and then Jesus. And they absolutely freaked out. They dragged him outside of the city gate to stone him. And at the end of that verse 57, it says, Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. So here enters the story, this guy, Saul of Tarsus. Now, the very next verse is chapter 8, verse 1. Remember, they didn't write chapters and verses in. It was just kind of one continuous story there. So chapter 8, verse 1, it said, And Saul approved of their killing him. On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him, but Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison." Now, it's really important for us to understand what this guy, Saul of Tarsus, was doing. He's like, you know what? I am fed up with this. I'm not going to have it anymore. And he decides he is going to start persecuting Christians. And it says he was going to them, capturing them, and arresting them to take them back to be tried and thrown into prison. That's important. Remember that. So who exactly was this guy, Saul? Well, I, I... have a whole bunch of verses. We're going to skip over them for time, but a lot of us think that Saul was this really bad guy before he became Paul. He was just this nasty guy who hated God. And actually, that was the farthest thing from the truth. He loved God, at least the God that he thought he was following. He loved Judaism. Like he, he was all about following the law to the T. He, he goes through, uh, if you want to write them down, you've got Philippians chapter 3, Acts chapter 26. He's explaining his pedigree. Like, no, 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 you don't understand. Like, I followed Judaism as much, if not more, than anyone else. Like, I was absolutely zealous for God. So Paul's not necessarily, although he kind of is, but he's not this crazy, mean guy. He was doing exactly what he thought he ought to do for God. Except, guess what? He had the wrong thing in mind that of what God wanted him to do. All right, so now we go to chapter 9, verse 1. It says, Meanwhile... Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, and the way was just a name of Jesus. That's what they called him. They called him followers of the way. So he's like, you know, I am the way, the truth, and the life, that whole thing. So that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. So, verse 3, as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. So, just picture this. He's walking in the middle of the day, and we're going to see that here in just a minute. But this light flashes. Now, okay, was it like this little flash, you know, something in the distance was shiny or something? He doesn't explain it here, but something that Paul does is he refers back to this experience many times. One of those times is in Acts chapter 26. Paul is on trial in this amazing city called Caesarea. It's right on the Mediterranean. We got to go there too, this beautiful city. And he is appealing to King Agrippa. And so he says this uh, in Acts 26. He says about noon, so he gives even more detail. So he's like, it was midday. So imagine just crossing this road, it just no shade in the middle of the day in noon, how bright that sun would be. Did anybody go out and stare at the sun during the uh, eclipse a while back? Okay, don't do that, okay? Don't look at the sun. But as bright as the sun is, I mean, I had the cool glasses and all that. Hopefully you did too, okay? But he says uh, uh, to King Agrippa, about noon, I saw a light brighter than the sun. So picture this, picture him going right in the middle of the day, the noon sun is just beating on you, and this light comes and appears and flashes in front of him that's brighter than the sun. That would pretty much blind you, right? 
that would pretty much blind you, right? right? I was just making sure everybody was awake. I know, it's taken a long time to get into this. Okay, verse four. <clears throat> he fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute, what's that word? Me, interesting. Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. Now pause there just for a second. I'm going to take a little bit of preaching and creative liberty here to share my opinion and the opinion of uh, some other scholars too. I am not a scholar by any means. But um, I know it's, it's up there. It says, uh, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? That Lord is capitalized. And we're, we're going from the NIV, and in the NIV it's capitalized, and probably in most translations it's capitalized. I don't think it ought to be capitalized, and here's why. Because Saul didn't actually know who was speaking to him. This would have been, see, Lord is not a name of God. Now, we make it a name of God, but Lord means master or in charge of. So what he was doing, I believe, I could be very wrong about this, I believe he was saying, who are you, sir? So he was giving this reverence, like this, this okay, like you appeared as a light brighter than the sun, and you're speaking this voice like that's obviously scary, and like, I, like I, where is this coming from, uh, and I'm blinded now, you've got my attention, that, I believe, is where Paul is coming from. Now, that's going to make more sense here in just a minute. Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now, look at that. Two times in here, Jesus doesn't say, hey, Saul, you're persecuting my people, and I'm not going to stand for it anymore. Two times he says, you're persecuting me. Jesus himself is saying, you, what is wrong with you? Why are you persecuting me? Which I'm, I'm sure Saul was going, uh, well, not really, but he's it, like, I'm sure all of these thoughts were swirling around in his head. But there's two really shocking and awesome things that I'm sure Saul saw from this and that we could see from this. Number one, Jesus is alive. Remember, Saul was going around arresting, capturing, taking hold of people who believed in this dead guy, Jesus. And he fully believed that's what it was. He did not believe in the resurrection. And so, like, I'm Jesus whom you are persecuting, Saul's probably going, oh, that's not good, right? He's probably just, just freaking out at this point. So number one, he's learning, and we can see from this that Jesus is alive. That's really good news, church. The second thing is, here's another thing that's really awesome. Jesus is one with his people. Jesus felt their pain so much that he's like, you're persecuting me. If you're harming them, you're harming me. In fact, no pain of God's people on earth is unfelt in heaven. Isn't that good news? No pain of God's people, nothing that you can experience is unfelt in heaven. That is just awesome, awesome news. Jesus is one with his people. Now, so that was, again, we're reading from the NIV. I'm not a translation Nazi, but, but we normally use the NIV. That's, that's um, what many of you use. I sometimes refer to the New King James or some other versions, depending on how it says it. We're going to jump over to the New King James Version for a second. Here's why, and just have a little patience with me for a second. Because there are some verses and some things that are in some translations and are not in some other translations. And it depends on which ancient manuscripts that translation was made from. So in the NIV, there's actually a couple of verses that are not included in the New King James Version. So I want us to flip over to the New King James Version for a second. Now, whether or not they were originally in there, I don't know, okay? That you can, you can ask God when you get to heaven if, you're, if it's that important to you, okay? But I think it makes for a really good point. So the New King James Version, it says this. He says, who are you, Lord? Saul asked. And he says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. And then right here it says, 
it is hard for you to kick against the goads. What? No wonder they took it out. What in the world does that mean? Okay, I will explain. A goad, who knows what a goad is? Okay, very few of you know what a goad is. Cool, this is going to make even better illustration. I love that. Okay, a goad is a long stick with a very sharp pointy end that a farmer would use to when he was plowing the field and he had an ox in front of him. It's also called an ox goad. Okay, and so this farmer, you know, oxen can be a little stubborn sometimes, which us, okay, um, the, the farmer would, you know, would be trying to move along to move the plow, and the ox would get a little stubborn, and he would stop. Maybe he was tired. Maybe he just wasn't going to have it today, and the farmer would take that goad and just kind of poke him a little bit in the rear end, right? And most of the time, that would work, and they oh, I don't like that, and I'm going to keep on moving because it was really sharp, and sometimes it would take a couple of proddings to get the ox to move, right? The ox would be like, no, 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 (laughs) listen, bro, it ain't happening today. And so we'd poke him a little harder and poke him a little harder. And then something really interesting would happen. You ever seen one of those videos to where like somebody's just messing around with a horse or a cow or another animal is, and that horse or a cow, they kick behind them? Like that can do some, anybody like horse people or cow people or farmers? Okay, a few of you guys, like you, you know how powerful that kick can be, right? Okay, it makes for a really cool video. Okay. <clears throat> so imagine this ox not moving, the farmer is prodding it with this goad and all of a sudden this ox with all of its force kicks that goad. What do you think is going to happen? The answer is bad. Okay, bad is going to happen. What, what started as a tiny little prodding in the backside that was maybe a little bit sharper and a little bit more forceful ended up being this very sharp rod in or through the foot or the leg of this ox. And so when Jesus said, It is hard to kick against the goads. What he was saying was, I've been trying to prod you. I've been trying to get your attention, Saul. And and, and you're you're not even not moving. You're kicking against the prod that I'm trying to put in your life. Like, Like, Saul, I have a plan for you. I've got something in mind that I want you to do, and you're just kicking against it. Why are you doing that? That's exactly what Jesus was saying here. So I want to ask you this, and, and I'll preface this. Today is not one of those fluffy sermons that you're going to go, oh, that was a great sermon, Trevor. I loved that one. It's actually going to be the opposite. I'm not apologizing. This is where God led me and is leading us in this passage. But today is going to be a little bit more of a prod. So with that being said, here's a question for you. Are you living up to the calling that God has for your life? Now, before you answer that, we're in church. So number one, you have to be honest. But of course, the churchy answer is... Yes, of course I am. I hate to break it to you, and I'm in this category as well. You're not. You are not living up to the potential that God has for you. Well, why why would you say that? You don't know me. You're right, I don't. I don't. I know some of you, but I don't. But I know what I read in Scripture, and I know what God says that he can do through a true absolute follower of him that we can do so much more and I don't see that out of my life I'll let it sit there but I'm not doing everything that God has called me to do I'm trying to I fail miserably at it but are you living up to the call that God has for your life here's our first point simple followers of Jesus strive to reach their God-given calling 
They strive after their God-given calling. They, 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 they wake up every single morning and say, okay, God, the answer to the question is yes, now tell me the question. Like, like God, I want to follow you no matter what. God, I, 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 want to, I want to empty me of me and fill you. Like, God, I want to follow you. Simple followers of Jesus strive to reach their God-given calling. Or are you fighting and kicking against what God is trying to do in your life? Verse 6, and we're still in the New King James Version. It says, so he, this is talking about Saul, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Now pause here for a second. We have another Lord here. I believe this Lord ought to be capitalized. This is not sir. I believe right in that moment or just before that moment, as quick as that was, I believe that was the moment that Saul was actually converted and said, okay, Jesus, you've got my attention. You are now my Lord. What do you want me to do? I, I am yours. I am putty in your hands. Use me. He, I'm sure he did not know what that meant. But Lord, what do you want me to do? What a great question. It's a question that we all ought to be asking every single day. Lord, what do you want me to do? Now question, what was Saul on his way to do? To take hold of and arrest Christians, right? He was heading to Damascus. There, there, this Damascus was blowing up with followers of the way. I heard one scholar say there was probably about 10,000 Christians in Damascus around that time. Like, like as far as it was from Jerusalem and, and where all this happened, it was absolutely blowing up. And Paul or Saul heard about it and he was like, you know what, I'm going to go squash that. So Saul was on his way to take hold of and arrest Christians. Watch this. In Philippians chapter 3, you don't have to turn there. Uh, if you can flip quickly, that's cool. Verse 12, Paul, the Apostle Paul, him later on, says something really interesting, and I totally geeked out about it this week, okay? I'm one of those weirdo Bible nerds that when I see stuff like this, I'm like, that's just so cool. Maybe you're like, that was the dumbest thing I've ever seen, Trevor. You get to have your opinion, okay? Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. Paul is speaking and says, not that I have already obtained all this. So he's talking about to know and to be like Christ. He's like, I, I want to be like Christ. So he says, not that I've already attained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to, what are those next two words? Take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Now, here's your Greek lesson. I know we're, we're going to make it simple. Katalambano. Everybody say katalambano. Katalambano is our word, okay? This Greek word means to take hold or to arrest. Now, Paul is not necessarily saying that he's referring back to his Damascus Road experience where he was converted to being a follower of the way, but he uses the exact same word that would have been used that he was going to take hold of or to arrest Christians. Cool? I thought that was so cool. He's like, I, I was going to take hold of and arrest these guys, but Jesus he got me. He took hold of me. He arrested me. Like, like I am all his. He bound me, and, 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 and there is no escape. I just thought that was so cool. Verse 6. Now we're back to the NIV. He says, now get up and go into the city. This is Jesus speaking to him, and you will be told what you must do. Now here's, again, when we read scripture, we've got to take our time because there's so much and scripture is so rich with all of these things that we can pull out of it. 
Notice he says, get up into the go to city. You'll be told what you must do. This was Jesus directly speaking with him, which, by the way, Jesus was pretty much probably the best evangelist ever, right? So you would think Jesus would go, okay, here's what I want you to do. Okay, so I'm going to make sure that you get this right. So um, I want you to believe in, in me all the way. Okay, um, I, I want you to say this prayer. I want you to get baptized. Um, I want you to go to church a bunch. Um, and when you learn some stuff about Jesus, then you can start talking ab- about me. And de- notice he didn't give him this list of like these Christianese things that we sometimes think that we're supposed to do. He said, no, 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 I just want you to get up, go into the city, and someone else is going to tell you my mission for you, what I want you to do. He used someone to instruct Paul on his faith journey, which tells me God delights in using his people to carry his message to the unbelieving world. God delights in that. Like, let's face it, could God decide he was going to send angels flying around with bullhorns? I don't know that angels need bullhorns, but flying around with bullhorns going, you need to follow Jesus. He was the true Messiah and is, and, and, and like, you got to follow him. Like, that, like, he could do that, and it would probably get a lot of people's attention, and that would probably, you know, get them to believe. I don't know. But that's not how Jesus works. How does Jesus work in getting his message out to people? Through us. We call it the church. It's our responsibility to carry that message. Verse 7. We're going to read through a whole bunch, and then we're going to be finished here soon. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Interesting. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. Yeah, of course, he was blinded by that bright light. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street, which is interesting because Straight Street is still there in Damascus, and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. Now, this would have been like Jesus audibly speaking to you and said, Hey, John, I got a great idea. I want you to go uh, visit the head of ISIS or the head of the Taliban or the head of any terrorist organization. And I want you to tell them that you're a Christian. Okay, you love where this is going? Yeah, and I want you to, t- like, like, that would have been lights out for you and for me, right? That's exactly what Jesus was saying. No, go to this guy, Saul. It, everything's going to be fine. He's like, uh, Saul's here to arrest us and doesn't mention it here, but other obviously worse things were happening there. He's like, this is not going to go well, Lord. Verse 15, but the Lord said to Ananias, Go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Uh, If you want to write in Acts chapter 26 right there, and it says, "This, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings. Remember we talked about uh, uh, King Agrippa that he appealed to in Acts chapter 26? This is what this is referring to. Oh, the Bible was just put together. It's just bits and pieces. No, 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 no. This is a, another foretelling of something that's going to happen years down the road. Pretty cool. Verse 17. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, and he pauses for a second and says, Jesus, just want to make sure we're all talking about the same Lord here. The Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. Something interesting to note here. For his entire life, Saul had been looking through this lens of Judaism, and it was actually an incorrect version of Judaism, but he was looking at life through the wrong lens. He was looking through this lens of hatred at this guy, Jesus. Number two, simple followers of Jesus see life through God's lens. Simple followers of Jesus see life in a different way, not the way of any other religion, certainly not the way of the world, but we look through everything, every situation in our lives, looking at it through the lens of God, which basically this right here. Did, did God give us any tools to see life properly? His word, the Holy Spirit, and so we have tools that we can use to see life in the proper way, but we sometimes just kind of follow the world and see life through this worldly lens. Um, let's look at it this way. In the story of your life, who's the main character? Again, we're in church and we want to say, Jesus, right? Right? Okay, because that is the right answer, but it's not the correct answer many times. You are. You are the main character in the story, and I am the main character in my story. And, and, <clears throat> and we can say Jesus, but you want to know how I know that's true? One simple question. Who gets the most screen time in your story? You do, and I get it in mine. And so when we are very, very self-centric, and I get it, we are in charge of our, yes, Jesus is in charge of our life. Okay, but like, like here on earth, we have to be in charge. We have responsibilities and we have families and I get all that, but there is a different lens or a different way to see that. And we have to learn how to, I said it earlier, to empty ourselves because if we're full of us, then we can't really fill up with more Jesus, right? I love this quote by Alan Redpath. It says, before we can pray, Lord, thy kingdom come, which where does that come from, thy kingdom come? Psalm 23, right? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Okay, before we can pray, Lord, thy kingdom come, we must be willing to pray, my kingdom go. Ouch. Told you you weren't gonna like this. Don't worry, it gets worse. Back to verse 18. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once, he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. So this absolute dedicated Jesus persecutor became a dedicated Jesus preacher. He was persecuting the church and ultimately persecuting Jesus. And he became, well, I'll put it this way. Probably you and I are here because a lot of the influence of this guy, Paul. We are where we are. We know about Jesus because this guy who was trying to squash this message from going out into all the towns actually was the one that himself went out into all the towns and on these major missionary journeys to spread the gospel. And he is a very huge reason why we have the gospel here with us because of Paul. Number three, simple followers of Jesus are completely changed. We went from one 
end of the spectrum to another. I mean, Saul, Saul of Tarsus, although he was doing what he thought was the right thing to do, was a scoundrel. I mean, pre-Jesus, B.C., before Christ, man, he was, he was an awful guy persecuting Christians. Post meeting Jesus, he was a completely different man. I, I, I love this story. It's, it's actually, I hate to use his own example, but Tony Hammond, okay, Pastor Tony, scoundrel, right? He said it, okay? I'm just repeating what he said before, right? B.C., be, be, before, well, before Christ in your life. You weren't around in B.C., were you? <laughs> He's not preaching next week, and he'll forget by the time he gets back up here. <laughs> Without Jesus in our lives, man, I, I don't care how good you think you are, you're a scoundrel. Without Christ in our lives, we are absolutely nothing. And, and not just, I have some information about Jesus, like I attend church, without him being the main focus, the main character in our lives. We are not worthy of spending eternity with him. Simple followers of Jesus are completely changed. I've got four questions I want to ask us, and here's where the rubber meets the road. Here's where you're really not going to like the sermon. Take it up with God, okay? If you don't like them, take me out to coffee later this week, okay? And we're going to have them up on the screen, and at the end, all four questions are going to be on there, so if you want to take a picture of them and just continue to ask yourself these questions. Number one, the question to ask, God... Does every decision I make reflect you? Yes, it says every. Does every decision I make reflect you? Here's another way to ask it. Have I recently made decisions that don't reflect God? Kind of flip that over. Think about it. Number two, God Does every word out of my mouth honor you? Ooh, did somebody say ooh? Does every word out of my mouth honor you? Words, language, cursing, gossip, the way that we speak about other people, jokes, rudeness, a lack of patience or this attitude that comes out when we respond to people because psh, we're just done with them. Like they're annoying anyway, right? Does every word out of my mouth honor you? Number three, God, does every action I take glorify you? Oof, it's getting worse and worse, isn't it? Every action, everything that I do in life, does it glorify you, God? Now, this doesn't mean, please understand, this doesn't mean the only things you're allowed to do are pray and read your Bible and go to church. We have lives. We have jobs. We've got families. I said it earlier. We have a lot of responsibilities that we have to do. I get that. But in those things, are you glorifying God in those worldly things? things, if you will. Here's another way to ask it. Are there some areas in my life or categories or hobbies or habits or certain nights of the week that don't glorify you, God? Number four, God, does every interaction I have with the unbelieving world point to you? Here's a, my other way to ask it. Have I recently done things that point people away from you? It's a big question, church. See, simple followers of Jesus are completely changed. And again, I don't know another way to say it, but if these types of questions, and it may not be these exact questions, but if these type of, types of questions 
aren't plaguing you, aren't constantly on your mind. They're, they're not constantly like, God, I, I, I know I mess up. I, I know I don't do these things, but I'm striving. There's that word, I'm striving to do these things. If they're not on repeat in your mind, something's wrong. Something's broken. You've forgotten about the love and the grace and the mercy that God has given you. You're taking advantage of having a Savior in your life. You think you did the thing that you need to do and you got your fire insurance and, you know, well, this is my life. I get to live my life because it's mine, my, 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 my. Simple followers of Jesus are completely changed. I want to close with 1 Timothy chapter 1. <clears throat> Just a few verses here of Paul. Again, the Apostle Paul, formerly Saul of Tarsus, who is explaining his former self and his new self. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. It says, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has given me strength, that he considered me trustworthy, appointing me to his service. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and belief. I love this because he's like, listen, as bad as you think you are, like, I got that title. Like, I got the worst of the worst. He says it here. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. He's like, man, I, I was so bad. You think you're too far gone? Forget it, you're not. Like, I, I'm way farther than you ever could be. And God's grace and mercy were poured out on me. Verse 15, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. Notice he didn't say, and this is Paul the Apostle. This is good Paul, okay? He didn't say, I was the worst. He's saying, I am the worst. That, 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 was, that was still me. That's an old version of me, but I'm taking responsibility of that. Verse 16. But for that very reason, because Christ came to the world to save sinners, for that very reason I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, in case you didn't get it yet, I'm going to say it again, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. I love Paul's perspective on the grace and the mercy of God. Here he says it again, and he said it multiple places, I was the worst of the worst. In one of our passages earlier that we referred to in Philippians, he basically, as far as Judaism goes, he's like, I was the best of the best. As far as good enoughing your way into heaven, if that was such a thing, he's like, I tried to good enough my way into heaven, and it wasn't good enough. Like my pedigree, my, my everything, my education, who I, who I served under, like all of that was nothing. I couldn't earn my way into heaven. And also, he says, I couldn't bad enough my way out of heaven either. He's like, so I really am on both ends of the spectrum. And guess what? By the way, it's not about me. It's about the grace and the mercy and the love of Jesus Christ. That's it. There, there is nothing you can do except accept a free gift that Jesus gives. You're not too far gone, and you're not good enough. You're somewhere right in the middle, and that's Jesus. He's saying, Jesus saves all. So three things, three qualities of simple followers of Jesus. Number one, simple followers of Jesus strive to reach their God-given calling. Number two, simple followers of Jesus see life through God's lens. And number three, simple followers of Jesus are completely changed. Let's pray. <clears throat> Jesus, thank you so much that you are the best example for us. 
So God, help us to strive to live like Jesus. And (laughs) we're never going to make it. We're going to fail. We're going to fail miserably. But God, help that to be our goal. God, help us to reflect Jesus in what we do, in our interactions with people, in the words that come out of our mouth. God, just, just the actions that we take, the thoughts that we have, God, help us to honor you. God, thank you that you saved the worst of the worst and you saved the best of the best. It doesn't matter. It is all about you. God, help us to keep you at the front and center of our story. God, it's so easy for us to think that we are the main character in our story. But God, when we're tempted to look at other things, to look at ourselves or look at this world or the treasures in this world. God, help us to remember the promise is better. You made us a promise of eternal life if we accept Jesus as our Savior. Help us to remember, God, the promise is better. God, help us to be completely changed. Thank you that Jesus made a way for us not to be dirty, rotten, filthy scoundrels, but to be saved, to be changed, and followers of the way. Not a way, but the way. Thank you, God, that you make it so clear in your word that it is not by our own effort, but it is completely by the blood of Jesus that you poured out on the cross, sacrificing yourself, taking our sin, taking our shame, taking it to the grave, rising again three days later, proclaiming victory. Thank you, God, that's what you bring to the table. That is true hope. God, help us to hope in you. God, if there are some here this morning who do not know you as their personal Lord and Savior, who don't, who don't have that hope that you offer through Jesus, right now in this moment, convict their hearts, God. Take hold of them. Arrest their hearts. Catalambano them, God, in a way that you just wrap your arms around them and help them to know they can have you. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If that's you this morning, if you say, you know what, I, I, I need Jesus in my life. I don't exactly know what that means. I don't exactly know what that entails, but I know right now that I need Jesus. Would you just slip your hand up? I'm not going to call on you and make any spectacle, but I'd love to just be able to pray for you. Just slip your hand up and say, I need Jesus this morning. Thank you, God, that you are good. You are so good, Lord. Change us, God, in a way that we reflect you in all that we do all that we say, and all that we think. God, bless this time of offering. Help us to be a generous church because you have been so generous to us. Help us to be generous in this community and in this world, God, that it spreads your word and it furthers your kingdom in ways like never before. We love you, Jesus. We praise your awesome and holy name. And it is in your name that we pray. Amen.